to uh, re remind the committee uh, why we're hearing from about building codes and standards. We were discussing last week's Act 250 bucket was climate change, and in there there was a recommendation to add stretch codes, which led us down a rabbit hole of learning a lot about. Um, we heard from the past of House Guy, and we got interested in weatherization and wondering about how Act 250 could support the state's goals of. Um, Moving well, we, well, we, we need to learn more about what the state schools are and how you worked to implement that. Sure. Welcome. Thank you. So, can we just go through it? Sure. Yeah. 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 So uh, my name is, sorry. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Barry Murphy. I'm with the Vermont Department of Public Service. Uh, I, one of my roles there is energy codes. Um, so I thought I would start first of all with just a little highlight of the uh, department's authority as far as uh, the energy code to create and update the energy codes. Sorry. Loud with our machine. Ah, okay. I've not normally been accused of being quiet, so I will uh, speak up. So. Uh, Back in 1998, um, the, the state uh, decided that we were going to have residential energy codes. Um, so we've had a residential energy code since then. In 2013, the statute that enabled uh, the residential energy code was amended to include a stretch code that would apply and be the presumptive um, requirement for I-250 to meet 9F, the criteria in 9F. So basically, uh, this goes beyond the statewide energy code and gains additional energy efficiency through better shell measures, better mechanical requirements, etc. cetera. Um, on the commercial side, uh, we have, I think it's 19, no, was it, it was 2001 or 2005, I forget exactly when the commercial code was uh, was, was uh, approved, uh, but we've had one since, since at least 2005 that I'm aware of, um, possibly earlier. Uh, but no similar authority to create a stretch code was has been granted for the commercial code. Uh, so what we did was working with the Act 250 board was create a commercial guideline. What? Guideline, which they uh, they uh, kind of wrote into their rules as being the definition of best available technology, which is the requirement for commercial buildings in I-250. Um, so, as a result of that, that's what I-250 buildings have been doing. Again, it's improved shell, better mechanical, more air tightness, just to basically. Oh, improve the general uh, energy use and footprint of that building in terms of energy, heating, cooling, lighting, uh, everything. It even includes, to a certain extent, for large buildings, um, a requirement for photovoltaics or solar panels on the roof of buildings greater than, I think it's 20,000 square feet gross perimeter. So that's really aimed at you know, large box doors, that kind of thing. Um, so what happened in terms of certification for the buildings is when the code was proposed, um, basically it became a self-certification process where the builder or the architect or the architect and builder would be the ones that would be certifying that they designed the building to the code and then built that building to that design. Um, so that requires no, a certain level of uh, trust, I guess you would say, in the, the fact that the architects and builders are doing uh, what they're saying they're doing and they're following the law that would require them to actually meet uh, the code requirements. There is no current um, review of plans and there's no current inspection of buildings. Uh, there's no authority given anywhere to anyone to do that. There is, I believe, within Act 250, a uh, compliance officer, uh, but they generally only respond to uh, complaints 
Um, they don't have, obviously, like, there's one compliance office for the entire uh, region. Um, so they, they generally only respond to complaints uh, of a building that might not be meeting their Active 50 permit conditions. Also in 2013, uh, when the uh, stretch piece was added to um, the Arby's code, uh, there was also a few other pieces that were put in there. Basically, uh, for towns or municipalities that have uh, that issue certificate of occupancies, it became a requirement that the residential building energy certificate became entered into the land records before a certificate of occupancy could be granted for that building. Um, so that's uh, on the zoning administrators and town uh, administrators to kind of make sure that they follow that piece. Um, as for public, multifamily, and you know, commercial buildings that get inspected by the Division of Fire Safety, um, it is seen as a minor um, permit deviation, I guess. I forget exactly the, the correct word. Uh, but basically, they, don't, they will not issue a permanent certificate of occupancy until this is rectified. Uh, and I think that basically gives the, uh, the high level um, overview in less than five minutes of uh, what it is. So I guess my issue, my question is, is do you have questions, specific questions? Um, what is the, uh, why do they use the word stretch? What's that, well, what that derived from? It, it, it's the common vernacular, I guess, for a code that goes beyond what is required for the, for, for the statewide. Yeah, I'm, I'm under with the Department of Public Service as well. I work with Barry. Um, the <clears throat> stretch in um, statute does not define an amount that has to go beyond base. It just says that it's more efficient than the base code. So there's no specifics on how far it has to go beyond. And I have a question. So sure. we um, we were we're going to add and stretch with that's in our draft bill to the section under the energy codes. Yeah. And um, the it sounds like from what I understand is that that's already happening. You've already required Act 250 projects to include the stretch. For residential, where the authority is granted by statute, we require it. For commercial, as I said, there is no specific authority in the enabling statute. Uh, which means that we couldn't require a stretch code, which is why it's a stretch guideline instead of a code. So it doesn't have the force of law behind it, although it does have I-250 behind it, which is, it's a, it's a slightly different path to get there. It has I-250 behind it by rule. But I don't think it was adopted by rule. It must be. Uh, it's added immune from the National Resources Board. So, so Barry Murphy is correct. The way that Act 250 has incorporated the commercial stretch code is by relying on the phrase best available technology in Criteria 9F. And then we've adopted a guideline, not from the rulemaking process, that provides instructions on two district coordinators to refer to the stretch code under that phrase best available technology. So we incorporate it that way, um, and so we are applying the commercial building energy standards, or the, this, the commercial stretch code right now. And if we add the language, it will cover residential and commercial now. It would be codified if we add it. It would. So it would address the issue that Barry Murphy identified, which is right now there's no specific authority. Well, I mean, it's actually a two-part thing. So, so there's... Um, there's, there's two different statutory sections that relate to the residential uh, and the commercial building energy standards. The, the statutory section for the residential building energy standards specifically provides authority to DPS to develop a stretch code. The, uh, the statutory section related to commercial codes does not provide that specific authority, and the bill right now does not change that. It just specifically signals that in Act 250, apply the stretch code, but it doesn't actually change the enabling authority to, to allow DPS to, to do that in the first place. That's a separate <coughs> That's statute. A, exactly, yeah, separate change, statute. It would line up better. Uh, I guess it would. <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, Representative McCullough. <clears throat> so I'm, I, I may not have clearly heard all the conversation, but what I, excuse me, what I think I understand is if we change the code um, requirements in Act 250, um, most especially as they apply to commercial, we additionally will need to change um, enabling legislation elsewhere in the books to, 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 um, to make this happen. Um, it, would, it would certainly help clean things up, and the, the specific statutory section is 30 BSA Section 53. Okay. Um, yeah. You said very specifically <clears throat> Act 250 covers residential development of a certain type, I think. Can you elaborate on when does it cover residential development? Um, I believe in, it covers uh, residential developments of 13 or more units, I think is when Act 250 kicks in, unless I'm not 100%. Oh, oh. If, if Act 250 kicks in, it covers it. Yes. Oh, okay. That, that, I'm sorry. I thought it was a certain scale of project beyond No, Act no. For residential, if it's an Act 250 uh, area, then it, it's, it's, it's entirely the covered for the residential. For the commercial, yeah. I, again, it's um, it's a guideline rather than a code or a definition of best available technology. Can you say that last sentence again? If it's commercial, then what? It, it's not necessarily a code. It's a guideline, but it's the guideline that defines best available technology, which is the requirement in the Act 250. Yeah, Representative Lefebvre, uh, Act 250. Yes, who, who, um, who, who, who enforces it or who more or less monitors this indeed is happening, even in a very limited sense. Is, is the DPR going to take a look at the... Uh... Well, I'm f there is no specific authority that allows anyone to go out and do any kind of inspections or anything else along those lines of any residential or commercial building uh, in the statewide code. Um, it relies on a self-certification process, as I said, where the builder will certify that he built the house or the building to the code. And if it's a commercial building, the architect has to certify that he designed the building to meet the code, and then the builder has to certify that he built the, the, the building to the design provided by the architect. You know, we, we have had some very impressive testimony here that the two major causes of uh, greenhouse gases and transportation and thermal in terms of when it comes to heating. And whereas the transportation sector is much more difficult and much more expensive to deal with and probably would take much longer, it seems like thermal offers us the best, for now, uh, place to start in terms of putting money in. And I'm just kind of wondering if uh, this kind of information is known to, you, to your department. Yes. Yeah, no, we, we are always there. We are the major sources of you know, greenhouse gases and uses. I mean, we deal with um, transportation in terms of electric vehicles, etc. So we do track... Not the vehicles, not the thermal. Yeah, well, we do track that. And, you know, part of what we do is we do uh, market baseline studies. So we look, we go out and we look at, you know, how new construction buildings are actually being built in terms of the code. Commercial buildings, you know, how, how they're meeting the code and things along those lines. But as to the specifics of you know, how the department deals in terms of you know, thermal energy outside of buildings, um, I'm afraid that's outside of my uh, knowledge base. Oh. Oh. Sorry, yes. Reminder again, on slight clarification. For the towns um, like Burlington that have local code officials, they do have the authority to um, check on um, energy codes. Yeah, of course. Yeah, we did yes. just took some testimony that there's um, some wiggle room there. That's perhaps, you know, if people are playing by the rules, they kind of, they're not getting credit uh, because there's no check. Yeah. Um, so is there a timeline to net zero that's built into our evolution of the energy <coughs> standards code? The uh, Comprehensive Energy Plan has a goal within it uh, where we would be at net zero design for buildings by about 2030. 2030. Um, we are currently 
almost finished actually the uh, final draft of the new administrative rule that would be the commercial and residential energy codes um, and that piece was you know, part of the overall gestalt, shall we say, of um, information that we used to develop the codes. We are you know, still significantly away but we, from meeting that net zero design piece, uh, but we still have three more. Uh, Two more? Three more, I think, uh, update. Um, but one of the limiting factors that might be in terms of reaching that is that it's the codes are required to be shown to be cost effective um, to show that you know, there's a kind of positive return on the investment for the additional money that has to go into building the buildings. Um, and currently, um, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm fairly sure that if we were to require a net zero building now, it wouldn't show to be cost effective. But in terms of you know, the cycles, evolution of technologies, materials, etc., it is possible that um, by 2030 that would be possible, but it is the kind of driving, <laughs> one of the major drivers for us in terms of how we can uh, design the code is we always have to make sure that it's cost effective and has a positive return for uh, the uh, the owners. So how do you do that analysis, cost effective? Um, well, for the residential buildings, we use um, Remrate software. Say that again. Uh, we use a software called Remrate. Rem ret. Rate. Rate. Uh, which allows us to basically model the building in terms of its energy use, uh, no, both thermal and electric, uh, in comparison to the baseline, which would be the uh, previous code. Baseline, so, previous code, okay. Yeah, because we're always, we're always building off the previous code to get to the new one, and we use that software to determine and dial in um, how to uh, get the maximum kind of gain, but still remain within that cost-effective envelope that we are required to do. And what time frame does that software look at it? Because we certainly have taken testimony that it's pretty quick if you have a net zero building that you're going to see a benefit. Well, for net zero, yes, you would see an immediate benefit, but net zero buildings tend to be anything between fifty and dollars and $100,000 more than your typical construction, mostly because it's a real detail-oriented construction. You're talking about for a house? For a house. For if you were trying to go for a net zero for a commercial building, uh, that would be really difficult, um, simply because the types of use, etc., of a commercial building might change over its lifetime, mm -hmm. first of all. Uh, second of all, you don't know exactly what's going to be happening within that building. If it was an office and going to remain an office, you could certainly do that. But if it's a manufacturing facility... Well, you would always just model on for most use, I guess. Whatever it's being built for at the time. Well, exactly. But we have yet to define exactly what we mean by net zero um, in terms of you know, what that would be defined as within Vermont. I mean, generally, it's, it's the, the thought is that... You know, it nets out your energy overall, but for commercial buildings, are we just looking at the building operational energy? You know, your HVAC, your water, your hot water, your, uh, your lighting, etc. Are we going to include all energy that's in that building? Because if it's, for instance, like an injection molding facility, those are very energy intensive buildings. So reaching net zero for one of those buildings would probably be very expensive uh, in terms of Renewability, renew, renewability of the energy source, will it be photovoltaics, wind, biomass, something along those lines. Um, the size of that system would be probably cost prohibitive at this time. Hey, sorry, I'm dominating for the moment. I usually let everyone else yeah, go, but I'm, I, I just, I'm curious if you know about California. Uh, well, my understanding is the California uh, code is that requires solar. I think it only requires solar for residential buildings. I'm not 100% sure, I will admit, but my understanding it is currently only for residential. 
Uh, and if it does apply to commercial buildings, I would be surprised if it applied to the full energy use of that commercial building and not just the building operations piece that I mentioned earlier. And have, I guess so then let's go to residential um, in Vermont. Is there anything that you would recommend? Is there a way for us as a legislature, say, to um, help the building community get to net zero faster? Because it does seem like one of the things is it's more expensive up front, but the cost to the purchaser or the person who's living there might be the same immediately. That's what we've heard. But the sale price would be higher. Yeah. I'm just thinking about this right now. Is there a way, if it's a really our goal, <laughs> In all honesty, I am not sure. Um, I, I would say that you know, right now, if the requirement that all residential buildings had to be built to net zero, um, it could be done. It would be incredibly expensive. There's not that many builders currently in Vermont that have the expertise associated with building to that level. Uh, as I said, it's a very detailed oriented um, building process uh, to the level where you know, if they're you know, driving in a, a, a nail into siding, etc., you, know, you have to patch that. You've got to put a little patch over it just to totally eliminate any air leakage from around that nail head. That's, that's the level of detail. Everything has to be taped, sealed, caulked. Um, and yeah, as I say, there's very few builders really within Vermont that have that level of expertise that are able to build to that level. Um, the intent behind the code is to continually improve over time um, and kind of build that level of expertise that would be necessarily um, able to do that kind of building. But to go straight to that, I don't think is uh, particularly practical for most house builders in Vermont. But maybe a workforce training program to support building that knowledge over you know time, not immediately. Um, again, uh, that's not really something I'm, I'm, I'm equipped to uh, comment on, unfortunately. Um, I have one more that I really want to sure. talk about. Um, the code, how do you measure how far, how, is there a percentage that we're how close we are to net zero in the current iteration of the code? And how many years between uh, re redoing code? Um, well, the, the enabling statute requires that when the national model code, which is the IECC, gets updated, uh, the department is required to look at it and decide whether or not we want to update to that or modify our existing codes. So the IECC was last updated in 2018, which is why the department is currently in that update process. Um, everything going well, um, we should be rolling out the new code to be effective January 1, 2020. Um, that code is somewhere in the realms of about maybe 15% better on the residential side and anywhere between 15 and 30% better than our current code on the commercial. You said 15 for both? 15% 15 for the, around about 15% for the residential code and anything between 15 and 30 for the commercial code because obviously the commercial code is a lot more complicated. So there's a, a lot more kind of avenues you can do, building size, building type, et cetera, is highly variable. So the savings associated are also highly variable. But, and so we don't know how close we are to net zero. Um, we do have a tentative roadmap to net zero. Um, and as I said, that was part of the information that we looked at uh, when we were designing this code. Um, everything lining up well and assuming that everything remained cost effective we could potentially meet net zero by that sorry net zero design uh, by 2030 but as I said the limiting factor that we have to deal with or one of the limiting factors we have to deal with is that we have to show that the codes are cost effective so every time we update it we have to show that it's cost effective and that, that there would be a positive return 
um, and to the uh, the homeowner. Um, and obviously that process uh, is a stakeholder owned process. So we, we, we were working with home builders, architects, etc., in order to um, design the code um, and make sure that you know, it is it meets the needs that we see are required in Vermont. So no percentage that you can give me now. Well, as I said, we have two or three code cycles left to get to to get through to, to twenty thirty. Oh, we're not halfway. Okay, so are we 25%? Uh, again, it depends on where you're taking your baseline from. Are you? <laughs> I get it. It's moving. But you don't keep track. How would you be able to estimate that you think we could make it by 2030? Well, the, there is um, available... Uh, basically, it shows you the energy use index, or the EUI, of each um, code iteration from around about, I think it's 1998. Uh, on the IECC, um, and it shows you the progression, including the percentage, in order to get down to an EUI, uh, which is roughly compar comparative with what is nationally recognized as being in the net zero ready um, standard. Um, so what I would say is I believe that our proposed code um, goes beyond the national model code as it currently stands. Um, I, I would say that um, our, our code is, our proposed code is better than the national model code for the 2018 IECC. It has deeper energy savings associated with it. So we are on a better track, shall we say, than uh, the national model code in order to reach net zero design. So I, do you have some big plan? It sounds like you have the stakeholders group with the home builders, architects, and so forth. Yeah. But I mean, are they not just looking at getting to net zero? Are they also looking at like what you need for education, for training, and also do they have the passive home model that they're looking at also? And one last question is, if you're your software is looking at models based on just the prior code, mm -hmm. but we have lots of old housing stock in the state, mm -hmm. then the cost effectiveness to do something in an older house would have to be huge yeah. to do a small thing. So I'm thinking, if I'm a homeowner and I don't know what to do, could I look on a website and see a chart that tells me something that says, you know, something that I can go to somebody who's going to make some improvements in my house and say, oh, look, this is, look at this chart. And then, are you a resource for people? Because I feel like, I feel like, it's, I feel like um, maybe we could do way more here. So Efficiency Vermont is the resource that's, that works closely with the department in order to do that. We do have, the code we're talking about is primarily focused on new construction. It does have an existing buildings <laughs> chapter. Um, the, the, it's new construction. It, it, yes, so all new construction. There, there is an existing buildings piece, um, which you know, explains you know, uh, when the, the code would kick in mm. if you were to be doing certain things to your home. For instance, if you're going to be building an addition to your home, you'd have to meet the new code. But you wouldn't have to bring your home, entire home up to the new code just because you're adding an addition. Or if you're replacing your roof and you're exposing the insulation in your roof, you'd have to bring your roof insulation up to code. But if you were just replacing the shingles, you wouldn't have to increase your insulation. Or if you're replacing your windows, you have to put in the windows that meet code unless it's uh, uh, because the window got smashed or something along those lines, then it's technically considered a repair, in which case you could put in the same type of window that you had previously. Uh, those Understandings that um, obviously that not all aspects of a new construction code can necessarily apply to a building as it currently stands. Um, as to the educational piece, as I said before, that uh, the department sponsors has sponsored and continues to sponsor trainings on code and everything else along those lines. Efficiency Vermont is the resource 
to help people meet um, energy code. They will do, they'll go out and they'll do audits. Uh, there's other entities, weatherization agencies and uh, builders that are part of um, Efficiencies Vermont. I forget what are they called, the energy efficiency, the builders and fuel dealers and network. network. Yes, the EEN, Energy Efficiency Network. Um, so they do, they'll go out and they'll do audits and they'll tell you, you know, where you can do improvements. Uh, you can do come out, get people to come out and do blow door tests, so basically show the amount of air leakage that you have in your home, and then identify you know, where the major sources of those leakages are. Generally, uh, those tend to be around your <coughs> rim joists, your band joists, doors, windows, unsealed cracks. Um, if you have exterior ventilation for a dryer, for instance, that can be a, a big issue. Bathroom fans that aren't properly gasketed can be a, another issue and oh, oh it's a lot of small things can make up a big difference in terms of people's weatherization one of the limiting factors is um, mostly that for thermal work is basically paid from the thermal energy and process fuels fund which is primarily funded through uh, Regi and um, FCM revenues and what was the second one? FCM forward capacity market. ISO New England runs a forward capacity market and Vermont uh, participates in that. Uh, and these revenues are what is, are used in order to fund thermal energy projects uh, by anyone. Um, but that is a market driven fund, so it's variable and it doesn't have a whole lot of money in it. Um, no, FCM revenues um, peaked last year and they're declining now. Uh, Reggie revenues are pretty static at the moment. So uh, there's somewhere between seven and $10 million available um, for thermal energy projects that are being run through the energy efficiency utilities, which are Efficiency Vermont and Burlington Electric. Um, Barry, thanks for the for the segue up to me to efficiency Vermont. Um, uh, most of us understand the global impact efficiency Vermont has had from the early days, uh, starting with just electricity and, and working now. And and uh, the chair has been questioning you. A, about how close we are with the new code you're rolling out uh, next January um, to net zero. Um, how, I, I would uh, ask the same type of question, but how close are you to the efficiency Vermont standard? Um, well, the efficiency Vermont's high performance building standard yes. um, in comparison to our code is not as good as the new proposed code. So they would have to update their high performance standard in order to go beyond um, what we are proposing having in place by January 1, 2020. That's very interesting <laughs> because uh, um, so then there there is a code in between there and that zero, the name is escaping me right now. Um, committee, do you guys remember? Huh? I didn't so, hear the question. Wait, oh, code between what? Between Efficiency Vermont's standard and the net zero standard, we had a presentation that there was one in the middle. Uh, well, maybe it's this. Uh, are, you, are you talking about passive codes? The, yes. Passive codes is essentially net zero. OK. I, Oh, yeah, you're right. There was an energy star. There were a couple of grades. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, what you just said is very helpful. <laughs> I was thinking of instead of stretch codes going to the efficiency of my code, and I'd be going backwards, wouldn't I? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Representative Lefebvre, uh, have you seen or, or had any critique on the work that a nonprofit? In the name of Heat Squad is doing, and, and cars uh, going around taking um, 
uh, uh, inspections of people's homes to show where they're losing their heat? I have no um, professional experience in that. I would say I did have heat squad come out and look at my home. Uh -huh. um, the gentleman that came out was professional. I you know, appreciate it, admittedly, because I'm in this field. Uh, I was His report pretty much aligned with what I was expecting. But beyond that personal information, no, I have no uh, comment on he's caught in itself. No, no, yeah, I just wondered how effective they, they are. Well, as I understand, Heat Squad is one of the weatherization agencies that does both low income and market rate. It's a non-profit. No. no. It's neighbor works. Oh, neighbor works. Oh, okay. Sorry. Then I, in that case, I'm mixing up my uh, companies, no. in which case I definitely have no idea. <laughs> oh, sorry, Barry. Sure. Sardines comes to mind a little bit right now. Yeah. And I'm also, as an energy geek, thinking about do we have proper levels of fresh ventilation <laughs> and everything else? We are actually we were scheduled to be monitored during this hearing because the answer is no. Yeah. Um, and yeah. we have this, this thing behind you monitors the actual oxygen level. Really? And supposedly we get oxygen, but often we get exhaust. So, yes. you know, it's, uh, not, no, it's not a healthy situation. Um, Understood. Understood. Well, my name is Jim Bradley. Currently, I'm president of the Vermont Home Builders, uh, actually Builders and Remodelers Association. We've recently had a name change. I'm also a Passive House certified builder. I'm a partner with Efficiency Vermont as a home performance contractor um, and a certified BPI auditor and a home performance analyst. Um, and I also build your, your homes as well. Um, and we're also building commercial projects uh, with a company I work for, Hayward Design Build. Uh, like a South Hero Library, South Hero Fire Department, Grand Isle Fire Department, um, and definitely building those to a much higher efficiency standard than what is even required by code today. What is important to me and has became very imperative, even as I was sitting there, and I just wanted to leap up a couple times just to say, you know, there's, there needs to be more clarification for everybody involved, more so just better understanding. There's a lot of fractured elements. There's a lot of really attractive um, aspirations or titles of what we can achieve for code levels. Um, but sometimes what falls short is an overall understanding of what does it actually all mean and how do we make everything work together. The RB standard, as was mentioned previously, was implemented back in um, 2000, uh, excuse me, uh, it was first written in 1997, implemented in 1998, and it has a standard that every three years it is advanced to, to be, become more robust. Um, and as that happens, um, there has to be review and oversight, and as has been done in the last year, um, that same oversight was given to make sure that what's going to be adopted is still cost effective and still has validity um, for the marketplace. And as the next code comes out in January 2020, one of the new requirements um, that is going to be implemented in the code is blower door testing for all new homes. And blower door basically allows you to quantify how leaky the structure is. Previously, it's been allowed to, yes, you could use a blower door, but you'd also look at a structure and say, I think it's this leaky, and then certify it. Real weakness right there. Um, and one of the biggest concerns that the association, the um, Builder and Remodelers Association, along with a coalition of other individuals, uh, I trust that everyone got the letter about Arby's enforcement. Was that sent out? If, if not, I have to. Okay. What was under, that? Under your name? No, it's under his name. Oh, from today's testimony? Yes. Yes, it, I will have copies. Um, yeah, yeah. Your testimony's up. Yes. Okay. And so basically, it's, and just to let you know who signed on to this, it's the AIA of Vermont, the Building Performance Professional Association, which basically are your energy auditors and home performance contractors, the Energy Futures Group, 
the Home Builders and Remodelers Association, or now called the VBRA, um, Housing Vermont Sustainable Energy Outreach Network, which is CON, um, Vermont Green Building Network, Vermont Housing Finance Agency, and Vermont Passive House. Understand that in each of these different uh, signatories uh, on this uh, letter, each of them have their own different level of what they think the perfect building might be or what the most affordable building might be. But we've been able to develop this coalition of individuals, seeing that there is real weakness in the enforcement component of the RB's code, and that really it's not protecting the public and making anything much greener, if you will, um, without proper enforcement, that we have seen a need that there needs to be some type of compliance, whether that is recognizing the fact that Act 250 is requiring Act, um, the Arby's Code and beyond, or if it's just the standard Arby's Code, or if you're looking at renovated buildings. There needs to be some sort of checks and balances by a third-party certif certifier. It's not just about developing a brand new legislative arm of the state or enforcement arm of the state that's going to be very, very expensive. There's actually already individuals within the state through a network through Efficiency Vermont and the BPPA of certified auditors, raters, building, profession, building science professionals that are able to assess what's going on and have the ability to report back what they find and to make sure that the buildings are being properly designed from a prescriptive measure, but also that these design or prescriptive measures are being implemented. You know, as I've said to other people, if someone can come up with a great design, but if the people on site do not implement those measures appropriately, you can't expect to get the cost savings or the performance out of the building on the other side. And so that checks and balances, even with well-intended individuals, is still important. After I dealt within the city of Burlington for a while as a builder, I developed a relationship with the inspectors there um, that they didn't come out to my buildings anymore. They trusted what I did. That's good from a builder standpoint because you don't have to spend the time doing that, but from a consumer standpoint, there's a little bit of a, a fallout there. And I, I welcome the inspection. When I had my first inspection in the a town of Colchester many years ago, 15 years ago, I had come from other states where you have intrusive inspections and there's really great checks and balances in place. And the gentleman walked in, walked around the building, walked out and said, to, hey, I said, is that it? <laughs> was, that, was that the entirety? And I was really surprised and kind of let down. And I'm looking at the fact of after being an auditor and being in over 2,000 homes in the state of Vermont, and doing the blower door test and finding out where things have been either purposely missed because, hey, let's just cut corners, or ignorantly missed, like I didn't know better. Um, and then seeing the customers that you're sitting across from realizing that they have a really big bill to fix this problem, not just from an energy efficiency standpoint, because a lot of these codes address energy efficiency, but it's also about the health and safety component of the building, along with the durability. You know, if I have to go up and replace siding on a home that's 10 years old because the walls were not properly appointed and the vapor drive is causing premature rot and that rot is turning into mold that's affecting the building occupants, energy efficiency to me at that point is a lower tier item. You've got to make sure people are healthy and you've got to make sure that what we're building is going to last because the production of those building materials expends a lot of energy. And if we're replacing them too soon, you know, there's no metrics to quantify how bad that actually is. So I look at it as a three-tier approach when you're looking at energy codes. What is it trying to achieve? With the Arby's code, it's actually trying to achieve not just energy efficiency measures by increasing the R values for insulation, like increasing, adding more insulation, making the building tighter, making your windows perform better with a better lower U factor. It's also looking at the ventilation component. Is the building safe? Is the air that you're breathing? Um, you know, perfect example. When you sleep at night inside your bedroom, you should have a thousand parts per million or less of carbon dioxide in there to get really deep, restful sleep that's, that's restorative. If you have anything above that, you're going to be more restless, it could lead to sleep apnea, and a whole host of health problems. The reality is most people will shut their door, close it, and they don't realize the levels. As a building science geek myself, I went in there and took the test with this, the CO monitor. When I turned off my air exchanger, we peaked over 4,000 parts per million. And we're, that's not un, unheard of. Part of it is my building is really tight. It's, it doesn't leak a lot. And a lot of the homes being built today are being built much tighter. But if you're not taking the ventilation component into, into, into uh, consideration and making sure that safeguard is in place, you're setting up a, a you know, the scales are out of balance again. And so having people properly trained, it was mentioned here or requested, how do you make sure people are properly tra trained? That's another issue. You know, how do we make sure that workforce development is there? I personally decided when I saw that these problems were going on, not only did I become an auditor, but I said, well, let's go to the passive house level because that's really the top tier. You know, passive house level is a standard international standard where you can actually build a home that will use 90% less energy than a code compliant home today. So you think, wow, that's, that's great saving, and it is. 
Another thing in our climate, in climate zone six, that even if you lose heat, have no power whatsoever in the house, no form of heat, you as an individual become a 100 watt heater, um, just because that's what the human body puts off. The house will never drop below 55 degrees. You'll never have a frozen pipe. And that's been demonstrated and verified through monitoring that this actually occurs with a passive house construction. So it is very robust. But as was mentioned by Richard Fazy of Energy Futures Group, if you build from the RB standard baseline and you jump up to high performance or stretch code, you're going to be going into a 15% increase. If you then go up to the passive house, that's another 15%. So let's quantify that. If you have a $400,000 home, you make that first leap, that could add $60,000 to the cost of the home. Affordable housing comes into question then. How do we possibly do that and make it more affordable? On the other side of that, if you go to the passive house again, you won't have that same $60,000 jump, but you may add another $30,000 to the cost to make sure it meets that passive house level. Because when you build to the passive house standards, it's not, just about, it's not just about your insulation, but it's about the insulation, the air leakage, the ventilation, and all these different components have to come into play. But it does make a house more durable, and the replacement factor it, it, you know, basically is decreased by how often you'll have to perform maintenance on the home, whether it's a roof system or shingles or windows. The challenge, though, is having that workforce that is trained on how to actually implement these type of homes or construct these appropriately. There are groups within the state, um, the Passive House Alliance, the Sion Group out of uh, um, um, Brattleboro um, is, at this point in time, it has a training program for tier one level contractors to know how to swing a hammer, but also how to tighten up a building at the same time and insulate it appropriately to make sure it's durable. But that's on its beginning stages. So some of our goals are way up here and they're admirable. But the problem is what supports those goals is not properly in place right now with workforce development and the economic factors in, in, that come into play with how much more expensive it may make a home. But additionally, some of the building material manufacturers have not caught up to speed yet. Point in case, at the South Hill Library, we're making a very robust wall assembly and we could not find a nail gun that would shoot a nail that was long enough to go through the layers of insulation to attach this siding appropriately to make sure it was maintained. And no one made one yet. And so, and this is, you know, the Larkin buildings over off of the interstate in, uh, in South Burlington, as you come off the exit there, the big buildings there, they ran into the same problem. So there's not a solution yet. So as the goals increase, we also have to have the infrastructure support those goals. Um, the main thing that's really important to us with the coalition, with the Home Builders Association, is the fact that the one thing we can do right now is make sure the law that's on the books currently, the, the, the level of RVs that's here now, is make sure there's proper compliance. Where things go astray or awry is the fact that if I, as a builder, want to build to that standard and beyond. But the other builder said, there's no checks and balances, and I have a six-year statute of limitations, so after six years, if I'm not caught, then, hey, it goes away. I've been involved in two cases as an expert witness, because when I heard this go into play, that Arby's was going to be adopted to the next standard back in 2015, I raised my hand. I said, where's the enforcement? Uh, litigation. Okay? And then I had this epiphany that, as an auditor, I'm going to be in these homes that are one or two, three years old with problems, and I'm going to be on the hook for this. And yeah, it cost a lot of time and money for me to go testify to these things. And in both those cases, the customer never came out whole. One prevailed with a $50,000 judgment, had $20,000 in legal fees, but yet had over $50,000 in repairs that needed to be made, so only came out $30,000 ahead. Um, not ahead, but that's, that's what he netted. Um, and so he didn't have enough to make his home right. Plus the whole psychological um, effect of going through the litigation process. Another customer, um, they built a home up in Iowa, Lamont. They, uh, it was a company from out of state. They came in, they built everything, they said everything was certified, it met the res check standards and everything else, but it just performed terribly. They weren't even living at the whole home full time. They were spending over $3,000 a year just in heating bills to keep it at 55 degrees. They were having burst pipes, several other problems with the home. Um, with the home. Uh, and then we came in, we did an energy audit, found the problems, documented the problems, went to court. It's been six years. $100,000 plus in legal expenses just on the plaintiff's side, and no one's made whole. They prevailed, but then the other side appealed, and so it's still stuck in litigation. And so it's not really providing that level of protection to the consumer that the law was meant to have. And so what we're hoping to see is that someone can, can take a look at this as we're moving forward, to look at the fact that there are excellent professional building groups out there to all different standards that want to make sure that this enforcement is there. Because if another builder does not choose to build to that standard, they can have a lower price point. 
But how do we get to the carbon reduction goals and energy standards that we're looking to achieve in 2030 and then 2050 if we're not addressing these appropriately? So we have to level, level the playing field and off, also offer that consumer protection that the law was meant to, to, to offer in, the, in its implementation. Um, a few other things. That Richard Fazy did testify that currently we are already missing some of the goals. Um, that, that are, are set for us in achieving net zero. And another thing with net zero, I can build a passive house, but if it's still using 10% of the energy of another home and it's not creating energy, then it's not net zero. Um, so passive houses aren't necessarily by default net zero, but it's real easy to get there. I can still make an old leaky log cabin net zero if I put enough photovoltaic cells out in the field and call it good and say I've achieved net zero. So understanding that terminology, um, that we have to understand how are we achieving those goals. I look at it this way. When you're doing home performance contracting or you're doing new construction, what are the things that are most important? I think that if we can stop the existing housing stock from performing the way it has been, thermally very poor, and we continue to make those upgrades, that's the easiest low-hanging fruit to achieve, along with new construction. And in new construction, make sure that we're appointing those homes appropriately. Um, the renewables, in my thinking, usually would come second in that tier. Because if I look at a windmill project that's near me in, in Cambridge, it was a $22 million project. Life expectancy of 20 years. The windmills look really great because it looks very yeah. forward thinking. The same money that was spent there that has a, a finite life expectancy, I could have put into over 2,200 homes and made them energy efficient and made them use significantly less energy, made them healthier homes, and the cost benefit would be much greater. It's just you don't see it behind the scenes. Because as a good home performance contractor or a good builder who does nice work, your work is kind of just like hidden. You know, the, the nice granite kitchen countertops or the wonderful living room, those are things readily seen. But the other work and how the building performs as a system is in the background, but it's still vitally important. Making sure that the current builders that are out there understand these principles and implement them appropriately is important. We have to have some type of uh, infrastructure to allow for that education comp component to come into play. I know Vermont Technical College does offer a building program. They do offer certification programs for um, energy auditors, but when it comes to the building program, they kind of stop with the hammer and nails and fiberglass insulation. They don't go to that next tier of how does the building really perform as a system and how, in a longevity standpoint, it's going to last beyond the 50-year mark before major repairs are made, or even the 20-year mark. And so there are a lot more factors to look at here. What we want to do is partner with the legislature as much as we possibly can. Um, to develop that workforce, to develop that understanding with builders, and come up with that enforcement program um, to allow for the proper checks and balances to be in place. We welcome that opportunity so that the consumer is truly protected, so that other builders who are not up to that standard are brought that way or they're not in business any longer. You know, it's just, it's, it's that important for, for what we do. And with that, I'll, I'll stop, but I would definitely entertain any questions. Well, yeah, so great, but uh, we don't need to create a government bureaucracy. We have the certifiers. How does that look? What is so there still needs to be, okay, I'm going to use Efficiency Vermont as a model. One thing that I've really liked about Efficiency Vermont as being a partner is the fact um, they already have a database where you're going to go do a home performance job. First of all, to be a partner with them, you have to sign a code of ethics. You have to have be properly insured. Um, if there are any complaints against you, they have to be investigated and you could possibly be dropped from the role. So they make sure that there's quality individuals in, as part of their EEN network. Um, and then with that, as you put a program in, it gets reviewed by one of their um, billing performance uh, 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 excuse me, uh, program managers, and they'll make sure that it looks like a viable pro project. They'll put that through the process. You'll go ahead and do the work. Then on the other end, you have to test out and verify the results. They then have a quantifiable um, savings of, of BTUs uh, for the house and energy savings as well. And the nice thing about it is if you want to go back and, and see what was done before, they keep a database of that. And so that, that the, the framework is there. I'm not saying that they need to shepherd the whole thing. I'm just saying taking that model to the state level and having a code enforcement officer, not the code enforcement officer that goes to every new construction site, but then receives the information from certified insured individuals as building performance, you know, home performance auditors or building performance pr professionals that can do these audits, can submit the data appropriately, um, and make sure that that data is being collected, but also that the design is being implemented appropriately. That you're checking the installation levels, you're checking the performance of the windows, and you do that test. Now, granted, what would that add to the cost? Currently, I do those tests for um, a builder in um, uh, South Burlington, but I'll go in and check how we see the house is, and and really, it's just that's the level. I don't have to certify for the installation levels at this time. 
and that adds about two hundred dollars to the process. Okay, if you actually did the full prescriptive measure, measures and make sure all those standards were being followed for installation levels, um, window uh, effectiveness, and um, air tightness, you would probably be looking at more like a four hundred dollar charge for a four hundred thousand dollar house. That four hundred dollar charge is not that exhaustive, and then that could be then that, all that reporting could easily go digitally to a code enforcement officer to make sure that database is being maintained. And if that individual says it doesn't pass, then they would have to make sure that they're brought up to that standard. Just to be sure I understand, so you're saying that every house that got built in the state of Vermont would need to have a certified person like yourself come in and do a, a pretty thorough inspection. It would take how long to do that? Or, yeah. You may be an hour on site. And, you know, and what, but see, they don't want to just do it after the fact. Yeah, that's One thing about this, we don't want to be reactionary because yeah. then we're on bad footing. In the upfront, you know, if you're going to be doing a development through Act 250, you have a set of plans for the certain certain type of houses you may be building. Go through that design process. Make sure that the proper measures are being implemented, and then test and verify at the end that they work. You know, it's not doesn't just look good on paper, but it was actually imp implemented, and then the performance can be verified. That's what I find to be very important here. Okay, so. Before construction, not during construction? But no, see, some measures need to be inspected during con construction. And here's the other thing. This is just the energy side of things. This isn't the code, code um, enforcement part where did they hammer the nail right? Was the truss designed appropriately? This is just one component of it. But it's a very important component because it's how the house is going to perform as a system, which is going to affect energy uses and health and safety and the durability of the structure. So while the house is being constructed, a follow-up visit is very good. When the passive house, um, when you're being rated to make sure you're meeting the passive house standard, you do have to look and you have a passive house certified um, designer, make sure that these different measures are being hit prescriptively. Then you get inspected by a rater in the field who then does the final blower door test to make sure those measures were implemented. So that could add a little bit to the cost, but it's the one way to ensure. I mean, to add to the bureaucracy of developing a whole different wing of the government to do that, that could be much more expensive. If the people are already certified, already in, in, in place in the state through the BPPA and Efficiency Vermont, I think it's a great resource to tap into. The other thing, it does help create jobs at the same time. Um, and maybe bring some of our young people to, to you know, encourage them to stay because you have these auditors, you have the ebbs and flows of energy audits. You know, where it's like the frog, the frog in the uh, boiling pot of water. Um, if it gets cold outside and I'm uncomfortable, I'll call. Or if I get that energy bill, oh my gosh, it, the prices of fuel have gone up and I, can't afford this, I'm going to call for an energy audit. You know, so that's the way it's been, you know, because people wait for that to happen. If we can have that happen on the front end instead, I think it'd be much more beneficial. Personally, I used to say that, you know, before a house is sold, it should have had a full complex energy audit. This is existing housing stock before it's ever sold and have an expiration date, you know, like within the last 15 years, because things do change inside of a house. I think that would be a great measure um, to have implemented. Do you know how many people are certified today? I do not know the exact number. I know it's well over 100, um, and that did, could cover quite a bit in the state. Representative Cohen. Well, Jim, thank you so very much. Yeah. I, I will also say thank you to the, uh, the now VP, VBPA um, for, for um, like climate change. I think um, the BBA has changed, and I, I applaud that. Um, I'm struggling to remember a day when, when the association came in here with good news for me, <laughs> and, and, and thank you for that. Um, I, I uh, uh, have, have a couple of uh, s specific questions, mm -hmm. one around so we've gone through the process. So, so, so then, should we require this and we, we strengthen it um, through statute in uh, 30 BSA section 53 uh, around the codes and then simultaneously require um, those codes be uh, certified as, as, as having been complied with and um, the final test, the, the, uh, the building fails. Mm -hmm. um, would, would, um, would you support uh, then a, a um, because 
if it, does, if it fails, you're not going to get an occupancy permit. If the uh, electrical inspector comes by, no way. Mm -hmm. um, no occupancy permit. Same thing for, for the uh, for the provider, um, mm -hmm. the utility. No occupancy permit. And so that would be, in my mind, the final the the final catching net. Mm -hmm. um, then would, would you? How would you proceed? Would you say, well, then, okay, based on the cost of the, of the building, there's a percentage charge that goes to, this is my idea, so I'm floating it by you. Mm -hmm. um, so, so based on the, the cost of the building, a percentage uh, would be then charged, and those dollars given to um, the, the, uh, the uh, house the state house warming program um, uh, through to be that's administered currently by efficiency Vermont. Um, uh, so, so, how do we deal with that as an issue, and and, sure. and, and how would you recommend moving forward in case of failure? Verification is hugely important. Um, with that, the homes that I'm testing currently, every once in a while you'll see that it, one doesn't hit, hit the same standard that you would have hoped for. It doesn't mean an ultimate failure, but because proper building techniques are being implemented by builders who are aware of how to achieve that, you'll get the anomalies. You're not going to get the wholesale failure. Um, and it's all about the education process. And as you walk around with the blower door and the infrared camera, and or just the back of your wrist, and you feel where the air is leaking from, you know, you say, well, dr address that this time. And the next time they go through with it, they get even better. So you do the checks and balances. And so it's, it's using a carrot instead of a stick mm -hmm. um, to bring them into that process, but they welcome that opportunity. The builders I've worked with, once they see that, it's an aha moment, and they get better yeah. at it, and they're improving that. So failure there is less likely. Where we do see failure more so is going to be in, in Vermont. It has a ton of renovations, just some nicely pointed to a house, some cobbed onto the side. Um, and there you see a lot of air bypass problems where it wouldn't pass a, a blower door without fundamental changes. But that all helps making the builder smarter. Yeah. Um, and so I think that if you have that verification by a third party individual, you're allowing for that to be pushed aside and proper um, home construction to be accomplished, whether it's renovation work or new construction. So what I think I just heard was maybe not, it's unlikely there's a total failure. Exactly. Uh, so then uh, likely the technician will say, well, you failed here, here. And it could be corrected prior to, in new construction, mm -hmm. prior to um, an occupancy permit. Exactly. The one house that we did testify to, that builder really didn't have any understanding of building science. He knew how to swing a hammer. He knew how to set a house in place did not understand all the bypasses that come into play where knee walls are concerned or running uh, heating pipes through a knee wall that's cold. He didn't really understand that. Right. He's been doing this, strangely enough, had been before he went bankrupt, um, for about 10 to 15 years. <laughs> um, that was the way out of the court case. So once again, he, he, he claimed bankruptcy. Um, and so with that, these things can be headed off. And when you're working in tandem with auditors, instead of a punitive measure, it's a resource. Yeah. Yeah. And that resource makes us all better at what we do. Would you say that, that right now, um, builders, uh, quality builders such as uh, you represent, um, are not on a level playing field? Uh, most wholeheartedly, because you know we're, we're building to that standard, but we can put a bid out there. But if ours is sixty thousand dollars compared to the next person, yeah. and they're thinking just of how do I get my mortgage? Yeah. Because even the, the mortgage lenders right now have not been completely up to speed to recognize the value of a home that's properly appointed. So see, the whole industry has to go through this paradigm shift. Yeah. Um, it's, it's from the mortgage lenders saying that house has more value because it's going to last longer. That means the life of the home. They're going to be able to make their mortgage payments because they're not paying for other repairs prematurely. A bit. Um, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. No. Perfect answer. I I, um, uh, I appreciate that. Um, uh, you see the wheels spinning. Maybe smoke coming out. I don't know. <laughs> it's good smoke. Um, you mentioned roof trusses. Mm -hmm. So trusses and rafters. Um, does the does the new code um, <coughs> anticipate uh, structure structural strength that'll support um, PV? If you're doing the proper due diligence, you should be. I don't know that the new code actually addresses the structure okay. as much. Um, but you know, a lot of the homes that we're building have a design 
engineer or possibly a design professional like an architect, yeah. and they're taking these things in consideration. But you can still go do a, a standard subdivision and do a set of house plans that you have in your repertoire yeah. and implement all those, and it may not. Yeah. Not every home is being retro or basically appointed or fit up with the ability of going solar. Right. So I would. Uh, 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 I would from, let's hear from Barry. Yeah. So the, the new code does anticipate that um, PV would be installed on roofs. So it's a requirement that they have to show that the roof structure would be suitable for Excellent. having a PV nice. installation. Yeah. Nice. That's great. And 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 um, in order to level the playing field and 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 um, get this done right, it, it's been brought out by many. We need training, more training. And um, all, the Associated General Contractors of Vermont mm -hmm. um, partnered with the state of Vermont to train um, machine operators to work in rivers and streams. Um, and I, I would uh, I would welcome uh, your association working uh, maybe in concert with uh, Vermont Technical College. Yes. And and the state of Vermont for this kind of training for to train certified auditors mm -hmm. and to train the builders and carpenters themselves. Um, is that something you think you're here? In fact, part of the shift of this, of the VBRA, you know, during the leadership that I've been given the opportunity to have is shifting the whole dynamic. Yep. You know, getting it to the point where we have that educational opportunity and bringing the resources out there that already exist. There's such passion in the state of Vermont, but there's also a lot of fractured elements that no one's really working under the same uh, umbrella of the way that they could. Yeah. Not should, but could. Yeah. And so with that, it's recognizing who can do what well, yeah. and and also who can help with the resource that they may have, whether they're going to be a, an instructor that says, you know, I am a builder or I am a building science person, but I can offer that professorship at, at Vermont Technical College to give that understanding, yeah. you know, and, and working together. So what I was excited about with the, the, the people who signed on to this letter was the fact that you have a a lot of those fractured elements that are coming together for the same purpose. Yep. And so I think that opportunity is there and that education component has to be developed. And definitely that's what we, we're working towards doing. Awesome. Thank you very much. Okay, we have actually a list of Odie, Bates, and Faith. My question is maybe we can get the Vermont Bankers Association in here to see what, what they look at when they get out their mortgages and just have a talk with them. Okay. That's great. Suggestion. So, um, I guess this is kind of for my own information. Mm -hmm. Is is there a way we can apply what you're talking about to existing homes? And the reason I ask that is I live in a very old town, Bennington, and we have a lot of aging homes, and I live in one of those aging homes. And I'm curious to know if we can somehow, this is great for the new construction, I'm all for this, um, but for the aging homes, how do you, how can we apply something along these lines for that because i'm just throwing out something here is for windows okay mm -hmm. our house has a boatload of windows and a leak yep. and you know to help the older communities yes. with this and um and to get a return on it mm -hmm. so i'm an older guy um and where how would i get my return i probably wouldn't but the next homeowners would and so with that i think the the biggest word that i or fundamental element I think is missing from the whole dialogue is that of stewardship. Because when I sat across from people and they said, I don't get my ROI, my return on investment. Right. And so why does it matter to me? Well, you're gonna then pass off a house to somebody else and you're gonna go do something. I mean, it's our stewardship, it's our responsibility to right. do things right. Um, and so with that, when you go into a, in a home that's of existing stock and you do that energy audit, you're supposed to quantify not just what's benefit most beneficial for your company to make money, what's most beneficial for the home? You know, that's, that's the integrity you should bring to the plate. With that, it's the ABCs of air sealing. You, the A being for attic, B being, being for basement, and C being for the center of the home. And usually the attic is the best measure you can apply, but sometimes you have the old leaky basement, that that's where it tells you to be directed. But normally, that process of ABCs, and you develop a plan that maybe not everything gets done all at once, but if you have a leaky attic, just addressing that, the whole house is going to be significantly more comfortable because you stop the air leaking out and prevent more air from coming back in this cold. Um, and so having that done, yes, there are ways to do that. And the, the, the cost benefit can definitely be de demonstrated before the, the work is ever done. And then you'll, you'll get the performance on the other side. And then later on, on down the road, when more money is available, then you get to the B of the, of the basement or then the C of the center of the house. But is there a way we can make that part of this whole building issue that you're talking about. Well, see, 
what we're talking about with Arby's, you know, because right. Act 250 is a huge element. Right. And this is just a component of Act 250. Okay. Um, but the residential building energy standards currently is for new construction and renovation work where you're adding an addition, not renovation, excuse me, but for more so the, um, the uh, additions onto a home. So for the home performance side, there's no more requirement at this point in time. Oh, it would have to be something like, it, it's voluntary and okay. it's what you would like to do. Okay. So, I mean, definitely more investment there, I think, is, is hugely important. Okay, cool beans. Thank you. Yes, sir. Ah, yes. Uh, could you tell me what the size of an average residential or housing project is? Like, how many units are cool into a project? That varies drastically. I mean, sometimes you can be as little of, as two units. You can be as high as, as 100. I mean, there's some in, in Williston right now that are definitely over the 100 uh, unit mark. So it can, it can vary wildly. Are there a limited number of contractors who are capable of doing that kind of work? To the subdivision level? Yeah. To the higher? Yes. It's not every contractor is, is doing that. We were, uh, my associate who will be testifying later, we were talking about this on the way up there, that the, the, the reality in Vermont is when you get a tradesperson who is really good at what they do, Usually they get good enough and can advance only so far, they go out for business for themselves. But then there's not another person to help them. So they're really just going to be the one or two person operation and not be the bigger company that can handle the larger project. So they may be able to do a nice custom home or a couple of the smaller residential projects, but they're not going to be able to do a host of, of homes in the process just because they don't have the workforce available. I'm just wondering how many contractors would more or less take on some of the uh, changes and reforms you're, you're advocating in terms of making a, a building tighter, whether or not, you know, uh, you were talking uh, earlier about the lack of expertise and the lack of knowledge. And what would that really take to have, uh, you know, where would you have enough so you would make a discernible difference? Well, the good thing about it is Efficiency Vermont has already said that they are willing to extend the training for the RVs measures and other classes that they have um, to interested parties. A lot of times they just say, we just want to fill seats because we're already doing this training. So it's not like the state has to fund extra training because they said for our association right. that they would allow our members to be trained. So that can be something that can be accessed immediately in the next quarter. Um, as far as quantifying the savings, Certainly, that there's a way to do the, the mathematics around that, the metrics, to make sure that you're, you're getting the savings by the prescriptive measures. But there's also the performance part of it, too. When I've gone into a home and they've been keeping it at 55 degrees and struggling to keep it warm and, and being uncomfortable, you do an energy uh, improvement, weatherization, you go in there and now the thermostat's at 70 and they're not recognizing the same savings that they thought they would get. Well, because the house is being treated differently. So that is a hot, harder measure to quantify. But you can definitely do the due diligence up front with the design of a new home to know what measures are being implemented and get a pretty reasonable understanding of how that's going to perform from an energy standpoint. And you're basically giving us information from the residential sector, right? Mostly. Not, not yes. the commercial one. Well, the same building science principles apply whether it's residential or commercial. And the same challenges for a builder would be there. And as far as the occupants, you know, making sure they're in a safe and healthy and long lasting building. You're looking for the. Uh, to Oh, a cliche, a cliche the, the, the biggest bang for the uh, smallest buck. I mean, or, you know, in terms of trying to come to grips with some of this uh, thermal loss, uh, is there, does it make more sense now to concentrate on what kind of criteria you have for commercial uh, properties as opposed to residential? I think commercial uh, is definitely a, a wonderful opportunity there for savings. You know, and I, there are already those who are stepping up and, and winning awards for the designs that they're achieving, um, and so that's great. But there still is that that fallout where it is not being done completely, um, and that's why you know making sure that standards in place and properly enforced is, I think, crucial. Thank you. I appreciate your testimony. Yes, sir. Yes, we highly appreciate your testimony. Thanks for coming in. We need to give your colleague time. Do you have one more question? Well, the one thing, maybe too, too specific to Act 250, but what I heard yesterday, if I heard it right, is a dwelling could be a multi-unit development or a nursing home, and Act 250 applies to that. So, um, so would the residential code apply to the nursing home because it's a dwelling? Or I'm not sure how that would be interpreted just off the off face value. I believe that since it's a, a, a place that is actually performing operations for you know, money, in, in a sense, it would probably be more in the commercial yeah. code than it would in the residential. So that's not confusing to me. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, Laura, I'm wondering if um, Marcy Harding, I think I saw 
So I'm Kevin or Whalen. Uh, I'm the CFO of Black Rock Construction. We're a residential commercial real estate development and uh, construction management company. I'm also on the board of the Vermont uh, Builders and Remodelers Association. And I also am an associate of Keller Williams Vermont, which is the largest real estate brokerage in Vermont. So I'm pretty well connected to the real estate industry in general. Most of what I'll be discussing today and commenting on is tied to some macroeconomic principles of the impacts to the home buyers of some of what's being discussed, uh, some of the changes that are being discussed. I'm going to do my best not to get too technical. I know you guys heard a lot of technical data uh, from experts over uh, an extended period of time, including many attorneys yesterday addressing some of the de novo processes, uh, whether it goes to board or e-court, a whole, whole bunch of information. Really, my focus is on the practical impacts of the proposed amendments as well as some of the other considerations that are being undertaken uh, to the Vermont economy overall, specifically the home buyer. Um, and it's a particular focus on what I would call the moderate income home buyer, uh, sort of the workforce housing home buyer. It's the teachers, it's the police officers, it's your median income earners and families, which are the driver of the Vermont economy and certainly a key demographic. Um, our company employs eight people. Keller Williams employs either directly or through independent contractor agreements about 180 people. We have a large number of subcontractors and vendors uh, when we do calculations on full-time job creation. Uh, as part of some of the requirements, there's FTE calculations. So we certainly are uh, an important part of the overall jobs market as well. So having an understanding of the practical impacts of Act 250 and the proposed changes to Act 250 on the Vermont economy, particularly on the home buyer and on jobs creation, is pretty critical to consider. Um, and I know that one of the big concerns in Vermont and certainly at the legislative and um, administrative level is the cost of housing uh, and the um, available uh, affordable housing uh, for what I would call that, that workforce, um, your moderate income uh, individuals. So that, that's, that's really where my focus is today. So what I, 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 I'm hoping to bring to the table is a little bit of a, a filter of how to view these potential changes. It's certainly important uh, that we do apply energy standards and we do create the enforcement of those energy standards. What needs to be recognized is the increased cost. So there was uh, testimony from Barry about getting to a net zero and the financial feasibility associated with that. Um, Jim also alluded to the increasing cost of getting to certain standards. Well, that cost, most critically, is actually passed on to the consumer. It's the home buyer. So while the developer may pay the impact fee or the builder may pay the subcontractor to get to that standard, ultimately it is the burden of the home buyer to absorb that cost. And if we're in an environment where we're trying to create more inventory of affordable housing for working professionals, for moderate income families, it's critical to understand that as we talk through increasing cost of construction associated with energy efficiency, that we're looking at ways to balance out those increased costs when we're bringing new inventory <coughs> to the market. Uh, I'll also discuss, and I will try to be brief because we are running a little bit over, um, the other impacts that it has on the existing inventory. So while we, I actually- You don't need to finish it. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Uh, I'll still try to be quick. I tend to be a little robust, but I appreciate the extra time. Um, there is an impact on the existing inventory, so while Act 250 really governs the creation of new inventory, there's impacts that Act 250 and the proposed changes may have on the existing inventory and the existing home sales market. Um, so when we're talking about the increase in 
cost to the home buyer resulting from Act 250, it, one of the pieces that needs to be looked at is where those variable costs are coming from. So to some extent, lumber, concrete, materials, those are all relatively, I don't want to say fixed costs, there's variability from house to house, but ultimately your 2,200 square foot house in Williston will have the same material cost as a 2,200 square foot house in Bennington. Um, there's little variability there, so the question cost coming from. Um, and some of that actually has to do with the entitlement process with Act 250 uh, and some of the impact fees associated. A great example is the, the prime ag mitigation fee has doubled and close to tripled in certain zones in the last two years. Those increase in costs, while they're floated by the, the developer or whoever is doing the subdivision, ultimately they become a cost to the consumer. So as we're looking to enact or enforce existing standards and or new standards, it's important to recognize that there's a series of pieces that are creating increased cost, yes, to the developer, but ultimately the developer is merely a conduit to having the consumer, the home buyer, pay those costs. So I urge the committee and others to consider that as there's a enforcement and a drive towards an excellent goal of reducing energy issues with new inventory coming to market, that there may be some consideration of offsets or reductions in fees, perhaps even at the transactional level with the home buyer. Uh, there's property tax prebates that are in place based on income levels. These are the types of things that could be considered at the transactional level where perhaps the developer has paid that impact fee and then it can then be a credit at a closing, for example, to that home buyer bringing down that cost. So the fees that are collected can be utilized, but then the home buyer is not adversely impacted. Um, there's also some challenges with Act 250 on the technical side. It's becoming increasingly technical, so you require third party experts, whether that be civil engineers, attorneys, all sorts of different folks become part of the team. That dramatically increases the cost. The, the history of Act 250 came when there was far less robust local level, municipal and town level zoning ordinances, and it's certainly intended to protect the pristine beauty that is Vermont. I fly fish, I kayak all the time. I respect and understand the critical importance of protecting our scenic beauty. The piece that needs to be weighed into that is if we are increasing the cost of the home buyer through those protections, who will be able to remain to afford to stay in the state to actually be able to enjoy those things? And that is the fundamental is this is when you're doing a two million dollar house. $15,000 worth of prime ag mitigation fees, depending on lot size and impact, immaterial. It's at that price point, this sort of average housing price point, let's say two to 400,000, where that becomes a significant material impact. So as Jim was indicating, there can be 15% increases associated with the cost of the home meeting these higher energy standards. Well, at some point, the workforce and moderate income individuals, your average Vermonter, the average person in the electorate, is not going to have the ability to meet those costs. Yeah, coming from an area where it's not unusual for a house to sell for $100,000, what you're saying is a very good point. It, 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 it's, it, and from a percentage basis, again, it's, if you look at Chittenden County, admittedly, and our company, we build higher end homes. Part of that is predicated on the fact that the cost of actually getting the lot and the infrastructure in place, I believe historically towns used to put in the roads themselves at their cost. Now it's the cost of the developer and then we hand it off. Ultimately, the cost of the developer should always be considered it's not a cost of the developer. So when select boards talk about impact fees for upgraded water infrastructure, well, the developer will pay for it. Nope, the developer floats the cost the cost ultimately passes through to the home buyer. So as we talk today about the proposed amendments, which are excellent, um, we need to strive towards creating a greener Vermont and continuing to maintain 
the natural and scenic beauty of our state, there needs to be offset somewhere else to not create this additional burden on the home buyer. Uh, um, has a question. Sure. <clears throat> so um, I think we heard testimony that if you were doing the improvements, the, the building more efficiently, that if that were, according to you, to go up 15% on a $100,000 mortgage that someone's paying thousand dollars a month for and they and if that was fifteen thousand that was added to the cost hundred thousand dollar house that's a hundred fifty more monthly could they look at that and say all my energy costs are going to be over the course of the year um, save that way because that was it explained as as a way mm -hmm. for someone to afford the the um the yeah, so I think what you're driving at is a little bit the, the cost of ownership versus the cost of acquisition. And those are fundamentally two different things. So a bank is not actually going to take into consideration utility savings. Generally speaking, a mortgage underwriting process doesn't really count utilities in a debt to income ratio. Okay, so they wouldn't be able to under their current structures, and I happen to used to work at a bank, commercial lending, not mortgage lending, but I know a little bit about this. Um, they wouldn't be able to actually give you the benefit of the cost savings because they're, in essence, in the future and they have to be determined. The other challenge comes from, and you, and you alluded to this question earlier, is the, the valuation situation. Is how is there a valuation difference between this house where you spend an extra $50,000 to get it to stretch code uh, or some other higher standard, it's actually not at the bank level, it's at the appraisal level. And that is dictated by market conditions. So the appraiser is taking fair market value determinants by comparable sales to make a determination of the associated value. The bank then relies upon that appraisal to issue the amount of the mortgage. The, the, the challenge may come in much like when you do an upgrade and you put the granite in in the kitchen because you got rid of the formica, oftentimes the cost associated with that is not a one-to-one -one ratio for the appraisal. So you may be in a situation where you're spending $60,000, $50,000 in upgrades to meet efficiency standards or stretch standards. You're not necessarily being able to recoup that money in the open market. I see what you're saying. So we would have to look at this also systemically and ask appraisers to come in here and banks to come in here. We would all have to be on the same page going toward the same goal. Mm -hmm. So, and then, um, well, that's an idea. And then, uh, question. Well, you were talking about in the beginning some of the costs is for impact fees, mm -hmm. crime ag mitigation fees, mm -hmm. and ultimately it gets past the consumer. Mm -hmm. But I'm asking you, does that assume that only if you build where you have to mitigate? What, what could you do to avoid having to mitigate? So, the, it is my understanding, and I am not an expert on this, I will admit, it is my understanding that the prime ag mitigation fee is, or the prime ag language states that it is there to protect the scarcity of Vermont's agricultural soils. It is also my understanding that there was a study done that um, indicated that there is a very large percentage of soils in Vermont that are prime agricultural. So I had heard a number from that study upwards of 70%. I, again, I'm not an expert, so certainly please don't rely on this. Um, the, Speaking specifically to Chittenden County, and this is a more generalized way of addressing this, as the Criterion 9L, which was sort of, for lack of a better term, termed the anti-sprawl provision, this is you know, um, the creation of the intent to create more density in areas that are already developed to preserve the outer areas, what that creates is an environment where you now have limited land availability to support this increase in density. So you now have parcels of land that are really the only developable portions in these areas where it's deemed to be an area of development 
and density development. <coughs> did, did, I'll give you a, a real life example. We have a 40 unit subdivision <coughs> in Williston that attaches to an existing several hundred unit subdivision. It's 50 acres, we're conserving 22 of it uh, as wetlands. We're not impacting it, we're putting up split rail fencing to prevent access. It will be perpetually conserved as wetlands. The other portion of the pause parcel has been deemed to be prime agricultural soils. This is a parcel that in all reality would never ever be farmed again. Um, it is part of a existing several hundred residential unit development. For the first 19 houses in the first phase, we're paying a $103,000 prime agricultural mitigation fee. And again, that's, we'll, we'll pay it, but ultimately, that will be priced into the cost of the home. So $103,000 by 19, that's not an insignificant number in a contributory cost to the house. So, well, yes, I apologize. Um, potentially some inaccurate information as it relates to that study. Fundamentally, it actually has to do with the available property. And the available property in given markets where that density oftentimes will be farmland, the entirety of um, the, the uh, retail outlets, the unit Essex, that was Lang Farm. Um, there's there's a, a, a lot of what has been created, particularly in Chittenden County, and admittedly we're at Chittenden County, <coughs> so I can speak more to that. Um, it was farmland, historically. Um, some of it hasn't been used as farmland in over 100 years, um, and some of it has been reforested. Um, but they're still considered prime agricultural soils. The reason why there is a need to impact it is as the state and the local governments have said, we want you to not continue to expand out, but go to a more dense development model. Those parcels happen to be within that dense development model. Mm -hmm. If you if you were to, you know, I don't know, but so if you were to say, well, the more you condense the development and the more land that you don't mm -hmm. touch, like you said, some of this perpetually conserved, mm -hmm. what would would it be a good thing then to have your question? Would it, if you were to say, well, for everything that you compactly develop and for the more acres that you conserve, would it be a great thing then to say then you're mitigation fees would then be lessened. That would be a wonderful thing to have occur. So there is no acknowledgement of our conserv conservation of the 22 acres of wetlands. Um, there is no offset to the, the prime agriculture. And of course, there are two different things. You can't have yeah. wetlands that are prime agriculture and you can't have prime agriculture that are wetlands. They're distinct and defined. Um, but ultimately, it's from a sitting 100,000 feet in the air, that's 22 acres of land that's being perpetually conserved, and we're still incurring significant fees uh, that will be passed on to the consumer on a per unit basis. So that'd be one idea. And the yeah. other idea you put forward, which is you, the home on fire would get back the permit fees and the closing from what fund? Wherever the money goes. <laughs> <laughs> In your opinion, in your yeah. professional opinion, yeah. realistically, can you build an energy efficient home like we're talking about, whether it's the Energy Star one or Efficiency Vermont, I think, mm -hmm. can you build a home in the, the median you're talking about? That, and I'm just kind of curious mm -hmm. what kind of home that truly is. Like so, what bedroom size and the whole thing? I'm just kind of curious. The reality is, is it is really challenging, particularly in the region in which I have my expertise. So I, I truly can't speak to Southern Vermont. Okay, that's fine. But within Chittenden County, mm -hmm. and to some extent Franklin County as well, we have a number of people contact us looking to do new construction at a moderate price point, let's use three hundred to three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Right. The challenge is actually having a parcel of land that can be purchased at a price point where you can build anything. Ah, got it. 
So you, be, the, 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 and I haven't had the opportunity to dive into the testimony about the impacts of, of, of Ag 250 and the, the inventory challenges that it creates, but there's a limited amount of inventory that comes to market. And so when you have supply and demand economics plus the underlying costs and risks associated with development, it puts a substantial premium on anything that has achieved a permitting status. So you now have a situation where there's such high demand for these lots, it's driving up the prices. There's a recognition that there is a, in essence, a restriction on outward growth, which limits the amount of land even available to be permitted. And there's a recognition of the landowners who are looking to either develop themselves or sell to a developer. So you now have the increased demand for a lower supply there. Once it actually makes it through the entitlement process, the appeal process um, is um, can be burdensome for a developer. Um, it's certainly a, a, a rightful process. I'm not somebody looking to remove somebody's appeal rights, though. You could have a situation where you're half a million dollars in capital expenditures at risk out, and for $295, somebody can file an appeal and significantly slow you down on a legal conformed project. All of that creates a situation where you may have a half acre lot in Essex that's $150,000. So that person who's coming to get a three to $350,000 house, it becomes an incredibly difficult conversation and you really can't meet a reasonably sized home for a family and hit those energy standards and arrive at that price. That's what I was getting at, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. There's a long way to get there. Thank you. 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 Thank the next question is, um, first, a, a quick statement. Offset's awesome. They're a great tool that a lot of people have purchased, fuel efficient or energy efficient. Um, electric vehicles, uh, put in solar panels, uh, and what have you, uh, that are funded in part with offsets. That was the carrot that got the whole thing going. And so I like your idea about that. Um, so does does uh, DBRA support the creation of offsets at time of sale? It, part one question. Uh, I can't speak to the VBRA support of that. Um, BlackRock Construction certainly would support that. The VBRA, I haven't had detailed discussions about that concept. I would okay. imagine that the VBRA would have general support of any amendment or change that will create an environment where more more mm -hmm. and more affordable mm -hmm. new construction can come to market yeah. because it will have a net benefit for all of the members of the BBRA. I like the first answer. Um, given that, um, I did not find your answer to the Representative Odie's question, just follow the money. Oh, I need to be more specific. Mm -hmm. Where do we find the money to do that? What do, do you have an idea of what program we could we could um, establish where those dollars might come from? And um, so, I think an ideal situation would not have the fee collected in the first place. Uh, admittedly, Which so the prime ag mitigation is an excellent fee to talk about, and, it, and it's it's a an aggregation. So when you talk about uh, let's energy efficient improvements, you can do the weather stripping, and that's a few dollars here or there. And then you can add in increased insulation, and that's a few dollars here or there. It becomes a death by a thousand paper cuts type situation. So prime ag is one where, in particular, it's sensitive because of the dramatic increase in that fee uh, recently, right? Um, Traffic impact fees certainly are important as we have roadway challenges and that needs to, that there's an idea of being able to have the developer still pay the fee, but then crediting back perhaps on an income basis or a sales price point basis, right? Without necessarily having to go capital A regulatory affordable, right? 
We, we have a tagline we'd someday like to roll out, roll out. We don't build affordable housing, we build housing that's affordable. The challenge is, is the underlying costs of securing land, the entitlement process, and then certainly the construction process make it challenging to achieve that. Good. Thank you very much. Representative Morgan. No. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, thanks so much for coming in. Thank very you. Very Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. All right, let's take a seven minute break and come back at 10 until we have. Uh, No, I didn't. Okay. Yeah, fine. I have prepared testimony here, and I will uh, send it to Laura after I'm back home. Yeah, that works. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, my name is Marcy Harding, and I thank you, Madam Chair, and committee members, for the opportunity to uh, speak with you today. Uh, I'm going to summarize my background quickly. I grew up in Shelburne, graduated from UVM, worked for Vermont Bank for 26 years in commercial lending and credit. In 1993, Governor Dean appointed me to serve as a member of the Vermont Environmental Board after a rather turbulent time for the board. In 1997, when John Ewing retired, Governor Dean appointed me to be chair of the Vermont Environmental Board. And I, at that point, I left my position at the bank. I remained in the position of chair until early 2003, after Governor Douglas was elected. I then worked for the Vermont Land Trust as a paralegal, working on conservation projects until 2014, when I retired. In the spring of 2011, Governor Shumlin appointed me to the District 4 Environmental Commission. Uh, that's the commission that uh, looks at projects in Chittenden County. In May 2017, I resigned from the District 4 Environmental Commission, but only because I was out of state caring for a family member for an extended period. Uh, my experience with the Act 250 program is long, but with some interruptions. When not serving, I've tried to keep abreast of changes in the law and with important cases, but I admit to being somewhat rusty on certain details. So I hope you'll forgive me for that. Uh, I have tremendous admiration for the law and the people who administer it. There have been many changes in Act 250 since it was enacted in 1970. The changes generally have made the law more complex, and I think the bill you are working on will continue that trend. That's not to say it's bad, it's just more complex. One of the more significant changes in Act 250 was just after I left the Environmental Board as chair in 2003. It was then that the appeal process was moved from the board to the Environmental Division of the Superior Court. Uh, it might have been called the Environmental Court at that time, but it's the Environmental Division of the Superior Court now. Changes in appeal rights were made at that time too, among other changes. My understanding is that the change in the appeals process and changes in appeal rights were sort of a package deal. One would not happen without the other. I think there was strong support for changing appeal rights, and the proponents of that change acquiesced to the change in the appeals process. I don't think the change in the appeals process was broadly embraced by uh, proponents of the change in the uh, change in who could appeal. This is just a little aside, if you'll bear with me. Patricia Moulton Powden was my successor as chair of the Environmental Board. Uh, Governor Douglas had vowed to reform the permit process during his campaign. Uh, a framework for a bill had been drafted, but was not yet public. Uh, I recall Patricia coming into my office to get an overview of the job she was taking and I was the one to inform her that if the permit reform bill passed, which it ultimately did, the job she had just accepted would be very different as the board would no longer hear appeals. I hoped that she would oppose the change, but she did not have enough time to experience the benefits of a citizen board before she was immersed in the legislative process and the bill was enacted. 
Having observed firsthand the degree of effort put into the decision-making process at the board by board members and staff, I thought it was a serious mistake to move the appeal function to a court where just one person would make the decision on cases which often involve much complexity. I was part of deliberations at the board. I saw the diligence with which board members would read and hear testimony and evidence, consider the law and case precedent, weigh the merits of the arguments, and reach a decision, often unanimous, but not always. The board also had the benefit of staff attorneys who would provide, who would, uh, provide briefs to the board members on the law and case precedent. However, it was always the board that made the decisions, not the staff attorneys. If you bear with me here, I'm, I'm going to just run through the list of people that I served with on the environmental board uh, and their background, because I think you'll agree that they bring valuable and varied experience. Uh, so running down the list, and these aren't really in any particular order, although as I get toward the bottom of the list, some of those people served for only a short time while I was there. Uh, so Jack Drake was a UVM geology professor. He was a former chair of the District 4 Environmental Commission. George Holland was a civil engineer. He, was, he worked for the Navy Seabees, if I have that right. I'm saying that right. Uh, and he was a Vermont Technical College professor. Sam Lloyd, uh, some of you may recall, was a, a former House member. And he was a former uh, business owner in Weston, Vermont, uh, the Weston Bowl Mill. Uh, and he was an actor. John Ewing was a former bank president, former chair of the District 4 Environmental Commission, and an attorney. Arthur Gibb uh, was an investment banker and former state senator. His picture hangs on the wall somewhere in this building. Uh, and he's a farmer, and I say, he was a farmer, and I say that because the last time I saw him with his sight impaired, he was on his tractor mowing a field on his farm. Uh, William Mart Martinez was an electrical engineer for a utility company, CBPS, and former Water Resources Board member. Uh, Alice Olenek is an attorney from the Mad River Valley. Becky Norath was um, from Manchester, a former District 8 Environmental Commission member. Uh, Don Sargent is an IBM engineer and had very long service to the Environmental Board. Uh, Jean Richardson, this is all something I found on the web, um, lists herself as a UVM professor, maple syrup producer, organic inspector, consultant on rural development, agriculture, and environmental issues. Nancy Waples was an attorney. She's now a judge. Lawrence Bruce is an, was an attorney, is now a judge. Gregory Rainville was an attorney, is now a judge. Steve Wright, former Fish and Wildlife Commissioner. Robert Page, medical doctor and former District Environmental Commission member, I believe. Uh, and John Farmer had, he was from Stowe, had some business, some kind of business background. I don't recall the details. And he was a former state senator, I'm quite sure. Um, and if I have any of those wrong, forgive me. I, I, I did that mostly from my own memory, um, but I think I have it right. Um, in short, my message today is that I think nine heads reach better decisions than one. Uh, we had nine on the environmental board. Uh, and we had some alternates as well. Uh, but compared to the environmental court, or, uh, where just one person is making decisions, I believe that the board model, model was much preferable. I'd like to cite one decision that you may be familiar with. A large mixed-use business park was proposed at the I-89 exit 1 uh, in Hartford. The regional plan, regional plan applied to this project. It contained specific language stating, and I quote here, principal retail establishments must be located in town centers, designated downtowns, or designated growth centers to minimize the blighting effects of sprawl and strip development along major highways and maintain rural character. The 
question in that case turned on whether the proposed project was considered a principal retail establishment. And with 35,000 square feet of retail space, the Supreme Court found that it was, reversing the decision of the environmental division. I believe that if nine environmental board members had considered this case, they, have re they would have reached the same conclusion as the Supreme Court and the District 3 Environmental Commission. And I encourage you to read that case if you're interested. This is only one case, but there are other decisions I could cite. My point is, just as with this committee, when you have a group of people together, all focused on one or more questions, you will generally get better outcomes than with just one person. A citizen board will bring expertise, experience, and perspectives gained from different disciplines. I'm sure you've heard from attorneys who prefer the court process. Some might criticize the board process as being too informal. I beg to differ. I'm sure there are citizens who appeared before the board uh, that found it too formal. Not all citizens were represented by an attorney. I believe the board struck a reasonable balance between being accessible and being formal, always giving parties due process. I suspect the cost to applicants and parties before the court is higher than before the board. And I reluctantly say that may be an unstated reason that some attorneys prefer the court process. One clear advantage to having appeals within the Act 250 process was the coordination between the board and commissions that resulted and the guidance the board was able to provide. I can think of several examples where the board developed a guidance, developed guidance based on a case it decided, either within the decision or as a separate policy. Such guidance became instrumental in helping the commissions decide similar cases and often was eventually enacted into law. Examples include prime agricultural soils and traffic impact fees. Lifting jurisdiction is another such issue that you are now considering in the proposed bill. Now, on some specifics of the bill you are uh, considering, it is a long, it's a long bill and I read it but there's a lot in it, so. Thank you um, for reading it. I'm not sure everyone I've heard from has. <laughs> okay, section 6021A1 um, says, candidates shall be sought who have experience, expertise, or skills relating to the environment or land use. I think it's beneficial to have some members who have such experience, expertise, or skills, but I don't think it should be a requirement for all members. And I say that because I think it would have been uh, it probably would have been a stretch to convince someone that I had those skills. And as a s aside, uh, I presume that prior service on a district commission or on a House or Senate Natural Resources Committee would suffice to meet that requirement. I hope. Representative Odie. Which section was that again? 6021A1. Now, if you go toward a professional board, uh, which I think might be under consideration, uh, I, I might feel differently about that. But um, if, if, if it's a, a citizen board with nine members or a large number of members, I don't think everyone that serves on the board needs to have uh, environment, skills relating to the environment or land use. Section 6026E, 6026E, provides for former commission members to sit on a case if current members and alternates are disqualified or unable to serve. And I think that that language is simply moved from another section, so I don't think it's, it's a new requirement. But I would suggest expanding this to include current commission members from other commissions who may be more knowledgeable about the current state of the law. And I say that because my recollection is that there are occasional cases where an entire district commission is conflicted and another district commission is called in to hear the case. That's just kind of a little technical. But. Section 8403A consolidates Act 250 appeals with appeals from ANR permits. Uh, I understand the 
advantages of doing this, and I, I don't necessarily oppose them, but I would like to say that I think this change will make it more challenging to find good, willing candidates to serve the board. It takes time and effort to learn the Act 250 law, process, and precedent, which of course is always changing. And adding on top of that at least 23 additional permits governed by different sections of statute would be a little daunting. why you included review in the name of this board, the Vermont Environmental Review Board, and not just the Vermont Environmental Board. You probably have reasons, I just wondered. Uh, and I also made a note that I, that additional staffing at the board level would be required if this change was to be made. There's certainly less staff there than there was. There's less staff there now than there was when I was there and when the board was considering appeals. Uh, so staffing would need to be adjusted. And in closing, on a very personal note, I'd like to say that it was very disappointing to me when the appeal function was moved from the environmental board. I was gone when the bill was enacted, but I still took it very personally. And it gives me great pleasure uh, to know that the legislature is now considering reversing that decision, and I applaud you all for doing so. I think if you were to make only one change to improve the permit process for the next 50 years, this is the change you should make. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Representative McCullough. Thank you so much, Marcy, for, for, for coming in, for presenting, uh, once again, a perspective from people who've been, been there and done that, and, and with the vision to look forward to how to bring that to, to uh, our state in the future. Um, I, want, I, I, um, I want to uh, put an exclamation point, I think, on the early part of your presentation where you listed, we could say, the magnificent seven. But there were more than seven. I didn't count them. And for, for our committee, um, I'm sure that there were at least several names ev everyone in this room would have recognized. Um, I recognized many, not all. Um, but I think it's especially important coming on the heels of yesterday's testimony um, by the, by the uh, legal community who prefers the status quo. Um, who always respectfully talked about the former NRB, but also at the same time downplayed the citizen board as, you know, just their citizen board, and, you know, they did a good job, they did the best they could, but they, you know, they couldn't be expected to perform as good as a judge could. And so, I think it's been really important that you you named these luminaries, if you will, um, out, and 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 for our committee to, to hear that. So I just wanted to put an exclamation point on that. So the 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 hurdle we always face when we when we do things in this room is um, FTEs. How much is it going to cost the department in, in, in employees uh, to to do the job? And that's usually a very effective way to kill a bill. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if in the, in, in the ensuing weeks we hear from the administration that this will cost some outrageous number of new employees, and so we possibly can't do that. You did mention we will need more staff, and and um, uh, curiously enough. The attorneys yesterday downplayed the staff's um, importance in the decision making because it was the judge, and actually, um, actually, I think said that the staff have an unusual opportunity to affect the outcome by their findings that they present. So, two parts. First, would you comment on that? And secondly. Um, uh, is there an opportunity to get staff 
from the existing um, uh, bodies to to uh, to flush out the the verb. Okay. Uh, taking your first question first, in terms of you, you said in terms of the legal staff, the findings they present, and I just want to correct that, the legal staff does not present findings, the board makes the findings. The board hears the evidence, and the board makes the findings. The legal staff would write what we call the bench memo that would summarize the issues that were before the board, because the board didn't hear, didn't consider all 10 Act 250 criteria. They considered only the issues that were on appeal. So it might just be a question like exit 11 was, did the project comply with the regional plan? Um, and so the staff attorney would write a bench memo outlining the issues and then summarizing the law uh, and then uh, summarizing the case precedent that mm -hmm. we should be aware of as we consider the merits of the application. Mm -hmm. So they, the staff attorneys never steered the board toward a certain decision ever. Mm -hmm. uh, the decisions were made by the board. Mm -hmm. uh, the staff attorneys were then directed to draft the decision and the board would review it, mm -hmm. sometimes several times before it was actually issued, quite often several times before it was actually issued, um, to make sure it reflected <coughs> the board's decision. Right. Um, so I really wanted to spell the myth that the attorneys on the staff were making decisions they were not. Uh, in terms of staffing, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm not involved in the process at this point in time, but when I was at the Environmental Board, you know, attorneys changed, so I was trying to count. I, I think there was a chair and there were four staff attorneys John Grothman can help me with this. One was, uh, there was somebody that was assigned uh, to the waste facility panel. There was another attorney that was kind of half funded by ANR um, doing enforcement, or maybe fully funded by ANR. I, I okay. don't really remember the specifics, but there were uh, definitely more attorneys than there are at the board now. I think there are maybe only two attorneys at the board, at the Natural Resources Board now. Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong on that. And and there were four uh, there when I was there. Okay. Um, uh, and of course, if you were to make this change, the load at the environmental court would be lightened. And so there might be some opportunity to move resources around. But really, I'm probably not the best one to figure all of that out. Right. Um, but I do think if you changed the appeal function back to the environmental board, uh, that you would need more staff than you have now. Right. Good. Thank you very As much. As you had in the past. Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. So, um, I, I have a question for you. One of the things that I found very compelling when we were on, doing our commission's work, and one of the reasons we came out in favor of this suggestion is that the idea that the board, if it had um, the authority to do the appeals, would provide um, better direction to the district commissions. But we, you know, we also need to understand that the line that that creates, that sort of wall between the board and mm -hmm. the district commissions. And if you could flesh that out for me, explain how that worked when you were there, because um, that that's just a piece of it that. Um, yeah, so I want to understand how that works. You okay, know. so the district commission makes the initial decision, and then if the decision is appealed to the was appealed to the board, uh, the board would not consider and not even see the district commission decision. It had the board had no contact with the district commission in terms of the the decision it made. It was a de novo appeal. We heard the evidence new. Uh, we, as I said earlier, only considered the issues that were on appeal uh, and we reached our own decision. If, if in the unusual situation that one of the, the board attorneys had been contacted for some kind of legal advice uh, during the district commission process, that attorney would be completely 
uh, insulated from the case before the board. There was a wall, if you want, between anything that happened at the district commission and the board. The board didn't even see the initial application. Uh, the board would consider the issues that were on appeal that were presented to the board and the parties would file new evidence and testimony regarding those issues. And then how did that also though, because you mentioned that you felt that it provided better oversight administration, how does that create that? Okay. What's the next So step? the board would reach a decision and it, it might have guidance within the decision or it might say, gee, based on this case and two others like it, we really need to develop some guidance in this particular area and it would it would draft a guidance document and then uh, about every six weeks I think there was a um, district coordinators meeting where all the coordinators would come into Montpelier and the attorneys would provide uh, training for those district coordinators in whatever the issue was it might be traffic impact fees or it might be uh, the new regime relating to primary agricultural soils or something else. And there was a, a fairly um, good amount of training to the district coordinators and they would take that guidance, if you will, back to their district commissions. And then to the aspect of whether this board, if we do go this route, should, should go back to being voluntary. You mentioned it's technical, some of the changes we have might be even more complex or technical. Is it realistic for us in this time to ask volunteers to step into that role again? How much time did it take? Did they participate in those trainings? Did they? How much time did the volunteers give to this? And the board, the board members you're talking yeah. about at this point, mm -hmm. they were incredibly dil diligent. They would. We would. Milk crates. You probably know milk crates. We would carry cases around in milk crates. Crates. That's how much documentation, evidence, testimony there was. Often we required pre-filed testimony, just like you like to get pre-filed testimony in your committee, um, which I'm sorry I didn't provide. But um, there would be there would be a lot of information to read in advance of the hearing, and our members did that. And I might add, I noticed there was something about per diems in this bill. Um, preparation was not compensated uh, with a per diem, only the time you actually spent in a hearing or, or a meeting. Um, but in, in spite of that, I always felt that our, commission, our board members were well prepared. They asked good questions. Uh, they understood the law. They understood you know, how to research case precedent. We had something called the E-Note Index, which listed uh, kind of the, the key legal conclusion from all the environmental board decisions going back to the beginning of time, 1970. Uh, beginning of time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and they would do the research. Uh, I think they were, I think they felt privileged to be part of the process. And you think that we could expect that of volunteers in the year 2020? I think you could. And would that be your preference if we go back to it? As opposed to a professional or quasi? Maybe there's some, maybe there's some middle ground, a combination with, with some full-time, more than one, so that when I was there, the chair was a full-time staff person. I, I was a full-time employee. The other eight board members only served on cases. They, you know, they would be called for cases, and we had, was it monthly meetings every couple weeks? I can't remember, but we'd have regular meetings where all the board members would come, and we would deliberate on cases that we'd heard and issue uh, decisions, and um, Quite often we would hear, uh, in those meetings, we would hear oral argument from parties whose case had been heard by a hearing panel of the board. Uh, so one or three members of the board would hear a case and draft a decision, and then the parties would have an opportunity to come in and argue uh, for or against the decision, and they would do that before the full board. So that's another thing we did in just regular bi-weekly or monthly meetings. Uh, and yes, I think you, you could find members that 
would be happy to participate. And, and again, maybe a combination of some, maybe three full-time staff, professional board type people, and six citizen board type people, or and maybe something like that would work. I, I really haven't given it a great deal of thought, but I do support the citizen board. Representative LaFave. Good, yeah. Good morning. Um, when the change was made to go from the citizens board to the courts, um, one of the reasons that I'm aware of that was driving that change was to uh, expedite the time it takes to achieve a permit. And I'm wondering now in terms of that argument that was going on at the time and resulted in the change under the Douglas administration, if you had any if you testified or had anybody from the board or if you have any sense of how long those permits really did take, what? Uh, I think there's statistics on that, and uh, I was I was not involved. So Governor Douglas was elected. He had run on permit reform. The writing was on the wall for me. I wasn't. I I knew that I was not going to be reappointed as chair. Um, well, I didn't know that until he called me and told me that. But um, you know, I did remain hopeful. I have to say, but. Um, but I wasn't surprised when I got the call, and Patricia Moulton Powden was the next chair. And in terms, the, the bill again, it wasn't even public when I met with Patricia Moulton Powden. Um, she didn't know what was in the bill, and I left. She came. I stepped into another job somewhere else, and I was on a very steep learning curve once again in a new field of environmental issues, namely land conservation. And I, I was not involved in the 2003 changes. I was disappointed in them, but not involved. Um, but your question was, um, I, I had something more to say yeah. about it. Uh, don't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, but I'm, I'm drawing a blank on what the rest of it was. Well, so. what you've said already, can I just jump to the question of, if, if you served as chair of that board, and oh, the timing. could see now that also you could be replaced by a change in governors. Isn't the, wasn't the board more susceptible to political pressure than a court would be? I mean, a court, a, a judge is, you know, basically has a six-year period of service and then he has to come before the legislature in order for us, to, in order to keep his job. Okay. And, we, and I'm wondering how, what kind of you know, how, how, what was the checks and balance on the board? Okay, the only, I should clarify, only the chair served at the pleasure of the governor. The other eight members had terms that were established generally, I think, four-year terms, and they were all staggered. So uh, a new government governor could not change the makeup of the board significantly uh, until those terms rolled off. Um, so I think that's in response to that question. Yes, yes. But you also asked about timing. I the did, the timing. Um, so I believe there are statistics about that. Uh, I know we had statistics when I was at the Environmental Board about how long cases took to process. And I believe there are statistics for the Environmental Court as well. And I don't believe the environmental court has speeded up the process. I think, if anything, it's a little slower. But I'm sure there's somebody here in this room that knows specifically the answer to that question. But hold on. Yes, thank you. Uh, so, it's your observation. Has it? Uh, I think there's statistics. I, it's more than my observation. I I think there are statistics that show the average time it took to process a case at the environment. Environmental Board and, and at the Environmental Court. But I'd also like to say, at the Environmental Board, uh, we would consider the Act 250 permit only. At the Environmental Court, with consolidated appeals, they hear appeals of zoning decisions, Act 250 decisions, and ANR decisions. And quite often, well, let's go back to the Environmental Board model, someone might apply for an Act 250 permit and be denied, let's just say, and appeal to the appeal to the board. The board could hear that decision 
when the appeal was filed and make a decision and maybe the board denied the, the project as well. Maybe at that point the developer goes back to the drawing board and says, I need to do something different here. The way it is now, the district commission might deny the project. It goes to the environmental court and there's a zoning application in process. There's a stormwater permit that's needed from ANR. There's other permits that may be needed. And the environmental court, I think, waits until all of those permits have been obtained, which costs the developer money to go through the process of getting the local zoning permit and the ANR permits before the court will consider all three of those cases, let's say, and, and maybe the court denies it, as the environmental board might have, and the, I, I think that whole process costs the applicant more. It takes more time because you have to wait for those other permits, which will ultimately be consolidated, to be issued. So it can take more time, and I think it most likely costs more money because you're in front of more. If I could just extend that a little bit. The, uh, you, I'm sure you are aware that we had at least four judges in here yesterday giving us testimony. Lawyers. Test lawyers, rather. <laughs> right. Uh, giving us testimony. And one of the things that I was impressed with with the uh, courts handling the situation and the environmental court was that the, one of the lawyers said, in the event um, a permit was denied, I can take my client and I can lead him down the reasons because the environmental court seemed to have a much more, you know, either judicial or, 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 or a narrow way of saying, these are the things we're looking at here and you have to show each one in order to prevail. And I can say to my client, well, argument on how we how to prevail on this this, this point did, did not carry. He said, I could not do that in front of the board. It was much more difficult. And so, you know, I'm wondering now that, you know, that, that if, if that if that kind of level of satisfaction of knowing that you've been, you know, treated pretty fairly and an independent when you appear before the court, you know, is is is, is going to be it's been lost, will be lost in the, in the event that we go back to a citizen's panel. But there are reasons for rejecting you. It can be more, more varied, let's say, more, more, more diverse. And so consequently, you don't have that kind of nice checklist where you can say, this is what happened here. Well, uh, we would issue lengthy decisions on the issues that were before the environmental board. We would take them up take up each issue, and generally it's several different mm -hmm. criteria. We would make findings of fact relating to the criteria, and then we would write conclusions of law that laid out the analysis that we did and the conclusion that we reached. And I would have to say that I think any applicant would be hard pressed to read our decisions and not know why not understand why they have been turned down. Uh, I, I don't, I guess I don't understand that comment. I, I think you can go back, all the environmental board decisions are on the website and you can go back and read them uh, or read a few and see how they were drafted and issued and I, just find it hard to believe that an attorney or an applicant couldn't read our decisions and understand where the flaws in the project's compliance with the 10 criteria were. I, I don't, I guess I'm, I just don't understand. I, didn't, I wasn't here yesterday. I didn't hear the comments. Uh, I, I, well, I think the idea was if you could go to, when one person's making a decision, you can go back, you can review why that decision was made. But nine people are making it, it becomes a little a little more cloudy, less, less well, clear. Well, there's still just one decision issued. It's not, it's not, we didn't issue nine decisions. It was one decision, uh, generally unanimous, not always. If it, if it was not unanimous, there was always a dissenting opinion written. Uh, and uh, again, I think the decisions were pretty well written and pretty clear. Representative McCullough. So, uh, sort of on that and on some of the questions I've already asked, I'll just comment that 
to my friends and several yesterday, our personal friends who presented, very skillful, <laughs> and and um, represented the the NRB as as very good, but but they were promoting way way better, and so that was their job yesterday. <laughs> um, they. They presented the uh, former NRB and likely the new verb as being tougher for citizens to go and, and um, present their, their cases against than, than the court system that exists now. Really? Yes, really. Um, so I'm just, that's your answer, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it surprises me. I mean, we had citizens appearing before the board often, yep. sometimes represented by attorneys, not always represented by attorneys. Uh, they, they, they also, I, 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 I feel that um, do, did not like um, depositions of pre-filed stuff. They, they thought that added to the cost and added to the the expense costs and added to the time. Um, but uh, you mentioned that that um, I think you've mentioned that pre-filing um, was a practice and that it worked well. Could you comment on the dis right there in in some cases the more controversial or complex cases, we would require pre-filed testimony. Uh, we would have a pre-hearing conference. We'd talk about what the issues were to be decided, who the witnesses were going to be, what a time schedule would be, and we would build into that time for the attorneys to prepare, prepare pre-filed testimony for their witnesses. Uh, and I think both sides appreciated that because they knew what the testimony was going to be before they got into the hearing. Yep. Uh, there was pre-filed testimony. There was also rebuttal testimony that mm -hmm. we built into the system. So, um, but our time frames were pretty tight. We didn't, we didn't, you know, we didn't delay cases six months or four months waiting for people to do pre-filed testimony. It was two weeks and then another two weeks for a rebuttal and then we'd go to hearing. Uh, I, I think uh, I think the parties appreciated mm -hmm. that. Um, thank you. The, the, um, there's been a concern raised that the new verb would be in an awkward position as also, if you will, a, an educator, um, a, a maybe often even providing some training educator training and and direction to the district commissions and then be hearing appeals made by the district commissions. I think you've already touched on that this morning, but would you would you put an exclamation point on that? Sure. The way that training normally worked was uh, through the district coordinators. So the attorneys at the board would meet with the district coordinators I, as a staff person, would not be in those meetings. I might stop in at lunch to just say hi to these people who worked out in the district offices, but I would not be involved in the, the training, mm -hmm. call it that. Um, but the attorneys and the district coordinators uh, would discuss whatever the issues were. Um, you know, quite often it was new changes in the law uh, or the district coordinators would raise some issue that they had grappled with in their commission to look for input from other district coordinators mm -hmm. on how they might have handled something like that. It was, uh, that's the way the training happened. Mm -hmm. uh, it was not the board meeting with district commissions ever. Yep. Yep. The only time we met, I, I take that back, there were, there were two times. There was an annual meeting in the fall and there was spring training in the spring. Mm -hmm. uh, and those, we invited district commission members and coordinators and board members and the legal staff at the board to those meetings and talked about 
bigger picture issues. There might be a debrief on, in the spring we often um, included a debrief on whatever it changed in the law at the legislature that year, that kind of thing. And was there a firewall for recusal? For recusal? Well, yeah, of, of, of a member who may have had an issue, who may have been maybe more intimately involved with a particular district commission there, decision. Right. There, there definitely were times when a member would recuse him or herself. Yep. Uh, it didn't happen often. Yep. Uh, one, one case I recall, that, yeah, one case I recall uh, involved um, development along the shoreline, and one of the applicants, maybe it was the opponent's witnesses, was a geology professor at UVM, and Jack Drake, who was also a geology professor at UVM and worked with Paul Bierman, ended up recusing himself mm -hmm. kind of at the last minute because we didn't realize that Paul Bierman was going to be a witness. Um, but yes, and there were four alternates, so we could bring in alternates if we knew someone had some sort of conflict of interest, but it, it didn't happen frequently. Yeah. We filed testimony when it helped. Yeah. Well, that's what we did have that. Yeah. So, so, oh, yeah, oh, oh, yeah, as far as Paul Bierman, right. Right, right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So, you didn't take ANR appeals? No, we did not. Any last questions for Marcy? Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. It's really nice. Oh, to you. oh one last question. Yes. Would you favor the, if you go back to the citizens board, the number of members on that board to, retain, to be repeated as nine? I thought nine was wonderful. Uh, again, you got to hear so many different opinions, and you had the expertise of people in areas uh, where you, you might not have had much expertise, but you knew that there was somebody else there that, that could help on that issue. Um, I thought nine was a wonderful number. Seven, probably be fine. Eleven might be a little unwieldy. Get down to five. Yeah. Five is a lot better than one. I mean, my, my message really is... Just like with your committee, if, if one of you had to be deciding what to do with Active 50 for the next 50 years compared to 11 of you, I think, I think you're going to reach a much better decision with 11 of you at the table. And is it a four-year service as well on uh, the commission? Ye, oh, on the commission? Yeah. Uh, ye, I'm sorry. I'm, on the, on board? the board, yes. Uh, yes, I believe our terms were four years. Uh, but I remember the chair served at the pleasure of the governor, so the chair could be removed. And you could be reappointed? But yes. Yes. And we had pretty good stability on the board. There, there was change during the years I was there, but not a lot. And we had some people with very, very long service who were wonderful in terms of, oh, I remember this case back in 1970-whatever, and they could talk about... Uh, something that would be relevant to what we were considering. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you again. Thank you. All right. Um, committee, we will be doing markup tomorrow with Ellen on the Act 250 sections that we've been focused on. Um, the, let's see. I guess I would ask you all for your input. We can start with what we just have been doing, which is the administration and appeals. Um, but we've also kind of heard, we heard from the building association this morning, because that was a follow-up from last week, so we focus on the climate change aspect part of the bill. So um, what's your pleasure? What is your mind in terms of Act 250 and the ability to dive into it? I'm up for what we just covered. It's crushed. Yeah, okay. Administration of appeals. Yeah. Okay. I, I would have requested that we hear from a judge on the, on the appeals. I, I know uh, Brian Grierson, who's the administrative judge, and was a uh, previous, but that was, uh, was uh, I believe, a Superior Court judge, uh, asked me why uh, uh, no one had contacted them to make, uh, to give testimony. And uh, so I just bring that up. I, just, I heard that you talked to him yesterday, just on the hall, that's what came up. So I would 
you know, given the fact that we're going to choose whether or not to keep the president's system or change it, I think uh, since he is part of this president's uh, uh, system, uh, somebody from his office uh, himself to give an opportunity to testify. You know, I wasn't sure about that because um, judges are not political, and um, and I guess I gave it some of my own thought, but I'm open to hearing what others think. I I I wasn't I didn't think that was necessarily appropriate. Representative McCullough. Um, I agree with, with, with Chris. It, it it's fresh in our mind. Um, we've heard excellent testimonies. Um, uh, both sides of the issue, if you will, the issue being what's in the bill currently. Um, uh, and I guess I would I would put forth that we do markup tomorrow, but um, what, what uh, Harvey said some weeks ago, it doesn't have to be cast in stone. It would be um, we don't close the book on that section and move forward. It's, it's for the purposes of the next iteration. Um, and um, we could modify what we did um, at another markup and uh, session prior to voting on a particular bucket, if you will. And, and um, uh, I hope I'm paraphrasing your thought. Correctly, you got it pretty close. <laughs> yeah. And 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 uh, so I, I propose moving forward with a markup tomorrow. I uh, I'm and would invite the rest of the room to think about what we've heard and think: is it A or is it B, or is it a combination of A and B? Meaning, what's in the bill and um, uh, versus the status quo. Um, maybe it's a combination of the status quo um, and, uh, and what's in the bill. And, and that's where I'm leaning and hope it presents some sort of offer in that regard for consideration as part of the work. Okay. I, I, would, I would agree with that. Uh, I think that I'm not ready to do final markup and be ready to vote on this thing because I think we're a long ways from that. But I think it would be good <clears throat> if we tried to pull together something on some of the sections that we've had quite a bit of discussion on yeah. so that we kind of, rather than, we've, we've heard a lot of information. Yeah. I mean, this week we've heard this one, this way, this one, this way, this one, this way. Uh, so I think if we can do some routine markups so we've got a guideline that we can work from would be good. Right, a guideline and also help us identify gaps. Right, where exactly. Where we think it's easier exactly. I think that's what I'd like to yeah. spend a lot of time, well, Friday and then next week. Yeah. And so I would encourage you, if you have a moment this evening, to read the sections of the bill that are related to this that we've looked over. Um, so we can all have it fresh in our minds and, and uh, think creatively tomorrow. Uh, so just to be clear, uh, uh, you think it's uh, not uh, not kosher to, uh, to bring an administrative judge to testify? If he asked me why, I want to know why. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, I don't. I'd like to hear from other folks. I guess I. That, well, that's what I. That is yeah. what I think. I, I think it's here in front of. Excuse me? So we have been here before. I mean, committee members on this well, subject. Oh, OK. So it's what happened then? I mean, if we're going to bring the markup in, I'm just wondering at what point if we're going to allow the judge to come in and testify. That's all. After the markup? Well, we're, if, we, we also, I guess, we need to do some markup. We don't have him scheduled. We can talk about whether or not the committee wants to hear from him right now. Representative Morgan. Well, if it's not appropriate, as you indicated, then we shouldn't. But if it is, it would be nice to hear the other side. Yeah, I mean, I, I was checking in with the Judiciary Committee on this recently and was like, well, I don't know. I didn't think that was necessarily appropriate. 
Um, and there was agreement on that. So I, I you know, they are, um, I don't know, this is new territory for me, but that was my instinct, and that I followed through with some folks who know more than I do. But he asked, he asked you uh, yeah. if you were willing to, so he apparently, they were apparently willing to, so. Yeah, yeah. Way, we had a conversation. Right? Right. 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 I think it is, I, I would like to hear. Okay, well, I'll talk to legislative council. Great. No, I think we need to put our energies on the start of some work. Yes. And we can take Paul's request as part of that conversation. All right, we will adjourn for lunch. We'll be back after the floor. Thank you. Thank you.